All righty. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody, uh, to the Understanding Ecosystem Services and Carbon Markets. This is our second session. We plan to have three. This is hosted by the Jefferson Center in Northern California. Uh, it's the Jefferson Center for Holistic Management, which I'm sure you all know since you've registered through them. Uh, I'm Paul Zorner. Uh, I am the host for today and will participate to a limited extent as a panelist as well. Uh, I work for Locus Agricultural Solutions, which is a, an agricultural micro company. Um, and uh, uh, our headquarters are in Cleveland, Ohio. I live in San Diego. Uh, and we do a lot of work in terms of trying to enrich soil health through the application of uh, various microbes. Uh, but we're also uh, uh, a, a company that, that uh, does a lot of work in, in carbon markets, uh, work with a variety of people, including uh, Regen Network, who is a, a member of our panel today as well. Um, I'm a weed scientist by training, I'm also an adjunct professor of horticulture at North Carolina State University and, and have been for a, for a lot of years. Uh, our producer today is uh, Olivia Brumwell. So Olivia, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Olivia. I work for the Jefferson Center, kind of heading up our marketing efforts right now, but I just spent the last 11 weeks out on the road doing some EOV monitoring as an intern, and I'm currently in school for horticulture at Oregon State. Great. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, so next are the people that really matter here because they are the ones with all the knowledge that are going to introduce us. So we're going to start with uh, Anthony Mint. Introduce yourself, Anthony, then we'll move to Sarah and then Elizabeth. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony Mint. I'm a chef at this point, sort of turned climate crusader. Um, our nonprofit Zero Footprint leads public-private collaborations with California state agencies like the Department of Food and Agriculture and Air Resources Board. Um, as well as in Colorado with the uh, city and county of Boulder and Denver. Um, our basic work is to mobilize the food economy to direct a few cents per purchase um, to create grants for regenerative practice implementation. Um, so basically kind of a circular economy to incentivize healthy soil. Um, I'll leave it at that. Awesome, thank you. Sarah. Hi, my name is Sarah Baxendale, and today I'm representing a company called Regen Network, and we are a carbon credits marketplace that has been designed by farmers for farmers, and it's very nice to meet all of you here today. Looking forward to the conversation. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Elizabeth Fastigi. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Fastigi. I'm the head of business development for the agriculture industry here at Amazon Web Services. And um, I have known Paul for a long time and uh, really excited and grateful that he invited me to join all of you in this conversation today and um, really looking forward to it. Excellent, well, thank you. So everybody, what we're gonna do, we're gonna kind of start on one end of the spectrum, which is the interaction with the, the people we all serve, which are those people that are, are buying our products, and eating, and you know, but also very concerned about, uh, about their environment and where their food comes from. And Anthony represents with Zero Footprint a remarkable en endeavor. And so Anthony, perhaps you could take some time and, and tell us how Zero Foot Footprint works and, and, and where ranch and pasture managers can go to learn more and contact you. Cool, thanks Paul. Um, well, it, there's really kind of two aspects to Zero Food Print. One is bringing money in and then one is sending it out. Um, so I'll start with the sending it out part first, which is um, probably of most interest to people. Um, so ranchers and man land managers in California and Colorado can apply for a grant to implement healthy soil practices, um, just the 36 NRCS healthy pra soil practices, um, including prescribed grazing um, at zerofoodprint.org slash apply. Uh, we should be having another grant round in October and uh, the maximum grant amount is $25,000. Um, and then I think the kind of more complicated part is how to get money into the program. Um, and so there's really a number of ways that we do that. Uh, one and the most kind of public facing one um, is through the restaurant industry and the food economy. Um, so basically 
it can be as simple as like a restaurant um, agreeing to add a 1% charge on the check. And then a few cents per purchase is going directly into a fund that <clears throat> gets sent out to implement regenerative practices. Um, and so the uh, kind of biggest picture analogy would be to um, creating kind of food system economy wide change uh, along the lines of community choice aggregation in renewable energy. Uh, so that's a bunch of you know long words and stuff, but basically that's where um, citizens improve the grid and they're sending you know five bucks a month on the utilities bill. Uh, maybe it's an opt in, maybe it's an opt out, you know, but over time millions of dollars is flowing towards you know a fundamental shift in energy production. Um, and so we began in the food industry and you know for many years ran a restaurant called the perennial that was championing regenerative agriculture and trying to make the best choices possible and kind of tell this typical like farm to table story but almost have it be like you know, world savingly good ingredients. Um, and then at some point we started to realize, well, even when we succeed, we're not actually changing the system. Um, acres aren't really changing, you know, we're supporting a good producer, uh, but, you know, it's not like that tiny price premium enables the producer to do, you know, the really big work um, of like large scale improvements in land stewardship or to, you know, incentivize their neighbor to switch. Um, and so the logic here is, you know, instead of like a whole city committing to 100% renewable energy, why don't we have a whole county committing to 100% regenerative agriculture, right? That's a pretty big commitment, just like the renewable energy commitment. So how would those things get financed? Um, let's get, you know, five bucks a month on the trash bill to go towards compost infrastructure and transportation and freight and logistics to get that onto the farms and ranches. Uh, let's get leading businesses to opt in with the 1%. You know, so if you can imagine your $10 sandwich or whatever becomes $10.10, then you can imagine 100% uh, regenerative food system. Um, basically in California, for example, a 1% fee added on the restaurant industry pre-COVID would have generated $970 million per year. Um, and that doesn't even include retail or anything else. Uh, so you can start to see how things would move really quickly if we could create that framework. Um, and so that's sort of what Zero Food Print is doing with our grant program is um, working with the RCDs to and Cooperative Extension and everybody to kind of create a systematic approach to improve land stewardship. Um, so I'll stop there for now. Great. So Anthony, you know, that, it's a really cool program. And uh, I'm just curious as to the uptake and the, the traction you've gotten. But also maybe another question is, what has been your response from people who, who when they see what you're doing, uh, I, what kind of feedback have you gotten in terms of their enthusiasm over it, uh, lack of enthusiasm over it? I, you know, my, my experiences lately and in, in the work that we're doing is that the average person on the street really does care about where their food comes from and the, the environmental impact of that food. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of questions rolled in there. The first is uh, the program began in 2020 and has distributed about $550,000 to 31 farming projects expected to remove about 18,000 tons of carbon from the atmosphere. Um, big chunk of that is from businesses. Some of it is also from philanthropy that stepped up to kind of help launch the program um, with some seed funding in the middle of COVID since the restaurant industry was so disrupted. Uh, the typical response from consumers is to not even notice, um, which is a good thing uh, because, you know, I think a lot of chefs and restaurateurs and operators are, you know, super low margin businesses who could you know, maybe they only make like 3% profit in a whole year or whatever. So there's no way in which anybody should be kind of like giving up 8% of profit. Um, but instead the logic is to simply add it on the check and pass it on to consumers in many cases. Um, you know, so it's a 1% fee at the bottom of the check. Consumers can opt out. Some are also internalizing it. You know, if you're buying like a pasta and it's 18 bucks, some restaurants will make it like $18.18. .18. Um, fundamentally, it doesn't really shift anything about the transaction, uh, and it sort of gives consumers almost like what they want anyway, um, which is just a way to make every purchase part of the solution. Um, and I think that, you know, kind of what you're referring to, like consumers wanting to know where their food comes from and all these things, uh, I would refer to that as farm to table. And so that's like a very, you know, well-established movement. The challenge, of course, is... Um, you know, even after 50 years, the whole organic movement is like one or 2% of acres. So that idea of like, let's buy the good stuff and cross our fingers and hope the whole world starts to get better. Um, you know, I think 
COVID has helped us understand, like, actually, we maybe should take, like, you know, active, you know, collective action, basically, um, to start making structural change. So rather than just buying the good stuff as part of a farm to table movement and hoping things change, this proposal is let's go table to farm and just directly make the change as quickly as possible. Um, except for, you know, that doesn't exist at the moment. So in a way, we're kind of trying to help establish um, a whole regenerative food economy. Awesome. I like that term table to farm. <laughs> That's good. You know, so Sarah, um, I think actually the segue is perfect now for you to talk about region network and how your system works. And the same question, how can ranch and pasture managers find formation and get in touch with you? And, and a, a little bit, and we'll circle back on this, I'm sure for all of us, including Elizabeth, but what, what are your buyers looking for? Why, why are they interested in working with you to, to incentivize growers to, to manage their ranches and pastures in a particular way? Yeah, absolutely. So if we pick up from the perspective of a farmer having this experience on site, I'll use Anthony's program as our use case. Um, so let's say we have a rancher, Rancher Jane, um, and Rancher Jane has gotten one of these food print um, grants that allows them to add a lot of compost or different types of soil additives or soil health activities to their practices. Region Network is an organization that's designed to come in on the back end of those implementation practices that are considered to be truly regenerative. And what we do um, with our carbon credits platform is we utilize um, carbon, um, carbon accounting systems that we've designed in house utilizing remote sensing that allow us to take a limited set of soil samples with a farmer or a rancher or a conservationist and then be able to produce high quality carbon credits out into the marketplace that represent both what is a truly regenerative agriculture practice, a limited set of inputs required from a farmer in order to make the process really simple and easy. And then our organization finds buyers in order to sell those carbon credits out into the marketplace. But what makes our approach really unique is a couple of different core values that we carry as an organization. One, our methodologies and our processes are fully open source. Two, they're designed with farmers and ranchers and conservationists specifically to ensure that the requirements, the process, um, the experience is very, very farmer centric. Additionally, we look for um, partnerships in the broader regenerative agriculture ecosystem where we as an organization are deliberately investing time into what we call keystone projects. And what we mean by that is we partner with folks who, you know, are a rancher that are maybe pushing the paradigm in their community. And they maybe have 10 or 15 friends that want to learn about how to engage with the carbon credit marketplace, but aren't quite ready yet. We specifically focus on finding individuals, organizations, and entities that can act as a vanguard within their own community. When they go through the process themselves, they then can be trained to become a project developer within their own community and then evangelize and pull in more people in a very organic and authentic way. Um, additionally, one of the things that makes our uh, platform and our registry really unique is that we actually have a set of tools and processes whereby which any rancher, farmer, conservationist, someone implementing regenerative agriculture or preserving ecosystems can take our tools and design their own assets. So your own monitoring methodologies that look at soil organic carbon or above ground biomass and your own assets into the marketplace that reflect your um, particular community's perspective on land tenure or permanence of carbon or how you think um, ecosystems should have value in the marketplace. So we have one product that we have designed, but we are primarily um, designed to put tools into the marketplace for other people to create new products. Awesome. And can you, can you give us an example of a project and, and, and what that rancher received at the end of the project and, and who bought those credits and why did they buy the credits? Yeah, so I can use our first uh, set of 
projects that we developed um, in Australia, we partnered with three different large scale ranchers that were over 2000 hectares each um, with an organization called Impact Ag. And what we did is we took a limited set of soil samples from these properties, calibrated them with remote sensing and produced these very fine tuned, very um, high accuracy property maps that show the changes of soil organic carbon for every single pixel across the property over time. And what we do is we take those inputs, do that processing, and then look at the difference between a baseline year, which is before practices have been begun, and then do a number of monitoring rounds over a 10 year time period. And the difference, the increases in carbon stock changes between those monitoring periods are issued as carbon credits. So one uh, ton of carbon sunk into the soil is one carbon credit. And we were able to sell these assets to Microsoft um, over this particular winter. Um, and what happens with the way it's structured is that every farmer ends up with more than 80% of the uh, value of the carbon credits. So unlike other marketplaces, which are time consuming and expensive and very complicated to figure out the processes, we have a digital system, which is super streamlined and simple. And it's specifically designed so that farmers get every single penny they can out of the transaction, that the fees and the processes are extremely minimal. So we can pass on as much value from the buyer directly into the hands of the ranchers to reinvest into their good work and be able to expand their economic opportunity quickly. Great, thank you. We'll circle back around to that. One, one of the things that I would comment on, and then I'm going to transition to Elizabeth because she is very much involved in data collection and then following these and validating you know, these credits. But one of the things you know, in our work with you, and uh, uh, you know, we, we do a lot of soil sampling with our growers, and it is a burdensome cost. Uh, if, for example, if we're on a, on a 5,000 acre cornfield or ranch or pasture, uh, we might have to take as many as 4,000 subsamples and then pool them and send them off for analysis. That's hard. And you can, again, just taking the sample can be hard depending upon what's on the ground at the time. So one of the things that, that uh, Region Network has pioneered, I, I'd say you guys probably wouldn't say this, but I would say you have pioneered because you've made it uh, so easy to use, is using a, a earth orbiting satellite to use multispectral analysis to actually envision how much carbon is in the soil down to 15 centimeters. It's stunning. And then they back that up with, you know, instead of doing, you know, the 4,500 samples I mentioned, maybe you'd have to do 50. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, it's just really remarkable. It, it, it makes this a much more doable enterprise and, and uh, very, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to say accurate yet, but certainly usable in the markets in terms of validating that there is a reasonable amount of, of carbon in the soil uh, without it being so, so burdensome. So what you've done there, Sarah, with, you, Sarah, with uh, Region Network is, is I think just a great, a great advance. Um, so Elizabeth, speaking of data and data collection, uh, it's one of the things that, that you know your your company AWS uh, is doing with your customers. Why is why is this important to your customers? And in general, how do you go about? What are the, what are the key factors in, in making sure that if somebody you know says that they've done something, that actually there's validation so that they can do it? Because in the end, the people who are buying these credits want to know that it's not just smoke and mirrors. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, so to your point, I, I think we all are very much aware that the industry is really honestly undergoing a digital transformation and data is really at the heart of that, right? So at Amazon Web Services, I look after a range of customers that really span the whole value chain from major crop inputs companies and major equipment providers that sell to farmers and growers and ag retailers all the way through to food processors and integrated protein companies that then right start to get closer to the consumer end of the value chain. So we really take that end to end approach. And obviously what we're talking about here is very much a, a system, right? An, an agri food system that's pretty complex. And when we think about that ability to verify within a certain part of the value chain, 
you know, in terms of what's happening, data is really central to that. And I sort of think about it from the perspective of um, data builds trust, right? So it makes an action or a set of practices verifiable. It's kind of your ground truth in a way. So ultimately the challenge and the opportunity is to leverage it in a really scalable way, um, make it more accessible to more people um, from farmers to consumers and, and everyone in between. So, you know, that's at the heart of what we do in terms of providing that cloud infrastructure and services to really capture that data, enrich it, leverage it, and make it really valuable with machine learning and other insights. Um, that's that's really core to, to what we do and, and the role we play in this ecosystem in terms of making that data really usable and ultimately um, deriving insights that can really drive decisions, build that trust, create those verifiable credits or other, um, you know, other products that can actually be transacted in a system like this. Yeah, no, thank you. You know, I think in, from a scientific viewpoint too, one of the sayings that, you know, I've always heard my whole life and, and operate on, you, you can't optimize, you can't improve what you can't measure. Right. Uh, and no kidding, we're trying to take carbon out of the atmosphere for, for global environmental purposes. But the cool thing about it is the more carbon you put in soil, the more productive the soil is. And so what I think is really exciting now is that not only have markets by which uh, we can incentivize people to begin to, to invest in, in, in starting these practices or continuing them, but also um, that as a result, that the soil itself becomes more productive. Uh, and so I think these various measurement tools become, become, become really, really important. Um, so I want to come back because one of the things that, that, that I think is important here to, to get across to people is I, I think that, you know, the world is waking up to the importance of regenerative agriculture. People care. Um, you know, one of the things that we do at Locus, uh, I also work with a, with a, co a consortium called the Alternative Fuels and uh, uh, Chemicals uh, Coalition. We work on food as well, but we're, we're working to drive a, a consumer label, something this is it's not entirely related to the carbon market, but as it would be like an organic seal, but a, a seal that would go on a, on a gallon of milk, a, a pound of hamburger. And as you would, if you're hearing some crying, that's my two-year-old granddaughter in the background, the world that we live in these days. But um, uh, the, or, or uh, packaging or uh, uh, jet fuel or ethanol, so that when people are, are beginning to make purchase decisions, they can take a look and actually see, wow, this particular product that I'm buying is low carbon or even negative carbon. It's, it's stunning. Um, you know, with regenerative practices, with a lot of the folks that we work with at Locus, we've done the math. I actually just got back from uh, the Argonne uh, National Labs near Chicago, which does a lot of work in what they call their REIT model, which estimates carbon intensity. It's called the CI score products. And if you, you know, with regenerative practices, uh, you can sequester enough carbon, you can actually create carbon negative products. It's really, it's, it's, it's really exciting. Uh, but what you see, like there's a, a company called Allbirds working with Adidas that are producing carbon negative uh, uh, shoes or carbon neutral shoes at least. And you'll, you're beginning to see consumer labels, you know, exploring this. But I think one of the things that as we have gone and talked to people, people really do care. Uh, they, 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 they understand that agriculture is important. And so what I want to circle back around, and I'll start with you, Anthony, is, is what can you do or what have you done to further educate the buying public as to the importance of this and, and what kind of what kind of uh, lessons have you learned in terms of how do we how do we make people aware and how do we how do we help them understand the importance of this? Um, <clears throat> so we were running a restaurant starting in 2015 called the Perennial, and it was, you know, we had a whole animal butchery program serving um, beef from one of the Marine Carbon Project pilots. <clears throat> As you say, the ingredient was highly climate beneficial. Um, I think that pilot on 350 acres has taken in as much carbon as not burning a million gallons of gas, you know, just after a few years. And so it's like so radically optimistic. Um, 
again, this was 2015. So, you know, that was before the Kiss the Ground movie, before Biden had, you know, carbon farming and his climate plan and different things. People didn't really know the term. I don't know exactly what it would be like today, but I feel like at that time, um, it was very hard to kind of explain regenerative agriculture and healthy soil and carbon farming within the consumer's kind of like three second attention span. And then given that, um, you would have a lot of people who were super psyched and where can I buy more? Where can I get this? I wanna support that farmer. And basically the answer was like, oh, there's almost no supply. You know, you can come eat at this restaurant. You can find these few conscientious great ranchers around the world and stuff. Um, but I think that's that and kind of like that stat I mentioned before, like after 50 years, the whole organic movement is 1% of acres. 2% of acres. So I think we, you know, and I'm jaded, but I think we switched from trying to kind of beg consumers to vote with their dollar ineffectively to just saying like, we just need the whole economy to start supporting healthy soil instead of disincentivizing healthy soil. Yeah, great. Thank you. So Sarah, same, same questions to you. And I know, you know, Outside of outside of region network, you're also involved in a lot of permaculture and other aspects of things. What what's your view on how to reach out to people and gain their attention and help them understand how important this is? Yeah, I think a lot of farmers inherently know this. I mean, the moment you have added tons and tons of carbon via tons and tons of compost to your soil, I mean, the composition fundamentally changes and. Similar to Anthony's background, you know, my background is farming. I ran the nation's largest urban farmer training program before working for Regen. And so what's been really dynamic and interesting is, you know, our organization is a bunch of, you know, retired farmers that decided that working on an individual farm basis wasn't going to create global catalytic change. And so we spend a lot of time with farmers talking with each and every one of them about you know, what are they really doing on their properties? What do they see on their properties? What's the trends in evolution? And I don't think so much that it's challenging to find people at this point that are interested in these conversations. I think it's about bringing the communities together, which are somewhat disparate between the different programs that they're engaged in, you know, in the United States and more globally. And being able to create spaces to have community-based conversations around what does it look like to change practices what are the assets that reflect our community values look like in the marketplace? What does it mean to truly validate that carbon is indeed, you know, still there in the soil? And what are the tools and systems that can serve the democratization of this conversation? And that's really the underlying reason why Regen Network exists as an organization is, is to democratize access to the carbon market space. And I know the intention of our company over time is to hand over the governance of our products and programs from our carbon credit registry to communities to govern via what are called community DAOs, which are decentralized autonomous organizations. And so I think we are all evolving into these conversations and evolving into weaving our communities together so they can be more empowered over their choice for themselves as individuals and their self as you know, decision-making communities. All right, great. I'm gonna, you know, Elizabeth, I'm going to go to you with the same questions in terms of how uh, AWS looks at this and, and, and what are you doing to kind of reach out to people and with what you've done thus far, uh, what lessons have you learned as to how to best communicate what we're trying to do to people? Yeah, well, I'll echo and confirm what you share at the start of this portion of the conversation around people are interested. Um, no doubt, you know, we, um, every customer, I would say almost every customer conversation has some element of sustainability in it, in terms of looking at their business and wanting to know how it can be more sustainable or how they can be developing products or services to be part of this, right. And to contribute to all of this in a really positive way. And carbon is really central to that conversation. So I think that that's, we, that's top of mind for customers. And we have lots of customers who are innovating and really thinking about, okay, how can data be part of this story as well, whether it's something that we want to build for our customers or a new way in which we want to really think about and shape and transform our business. 
And I think on the consumer end of that, I think what we're all sort of, um, because, you know, agriculture is sort of more upstream, right, on the, on the supply side. But if you look downstream, I think the consumer is interested, but wants to also be empowered to know how to make good decisions and make good choices, right? And so data and trust and verification is a really important part of that. And we're seeing an ever-growing interest in supply chain solutions and having um, you know, a real focus and interest from our entire customer base across the value chain around more transparency and traceability in supply chain solutions. And I think that's very much around how can we be providing more confidence and choice to the consumer and give them more visibility into how their food or fiber is being produced, right? So that's a that's a really big part of this as well. And I think we're just going to continue to see increasingly more transparency around that, whether it evolves to be, you know, some kind of a, a label, the way we have nutrition labels today that allow you to make a, a choice, right, based on the nutrition content of a product, but at, being able to have a lot more visibility into making a choice around the carbon footprint of that particular product. And, and all of that will be data enabled and capturing that information in one part of the value chain and really moving it through, right? Attaching it to a product as it, as it moves through the supply chain, ultimately landing in that consumer facing form. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. So Sarah, back to you. Um, so we've talked about data. We've talked about trust, which I think is, is really important. Uh, with your system, what, and your, and your customers are oftentimes big companies like Microsoft. I know you were involved with selling credits to Microsoft. What are those customers looking for and what's involved in actually generating a carbon credit in your system? Uh, so if some of our audience are interested in terms of doing things, what do they have to do? What generally has to be collected and why is that being collected? What is it about Microsoft or other customers you may have that they're looking for in order to, to purchase these credits? Why are, why are they involved in this at all in the first place? Sure, so I think I'll start with the company side because it's a little bit easier to digest. So like Elizabeth was alluding and like Anthony has said, companies wanna take responsibility for their footprint. They know that it's important to consumers. They know it's important to the globe. And, and frankly, there is a, a visibility and a flexibility that comes with business that is, is not yet you know, inherent in government or policy or university research. Uh, companies can just move faster. They can make a decision at a board level and take action and build whole strategies and move large forms of capital um, towards the types of solutions that inherently affect the farmer in a positive way. So a company like Microsoft um, was willing and interested in engaging with Regen because our methodology has a very defined accuracy um, analysis where we can say exactly what the uncertainty level is from the outcomes of our information. Additionally, there's, there's a number of different types of companies that are looking for carbon credit assets in the marketplace. Some of them are comfortable with modeling tools like the Comet tool, which has various different ranges of accuracy. Um, some of them are not. And so uh, we call the types of credits that we produce that Microsoft bought are institutional credits because they meet a really high global greenhouse gas accounting standard. And ultimately what they are is they're a location-based analysis. There is a boundary to that property, that data that we're collecting is from that property, that analysis is unique to that property. And so the outcome is much more known comparatively than if you're using models or regional estimates or generalized outcomes associated with those carbon credits. However, in our system, we have this very, I guess I would call it practical and open-eyed perspective about credits. So we have a secondary credit class that we call the flexible or community credit because we recognize that a lot of these um, carbon credits that are being put into the marketplace, they really don't meet that institutional bar. And there are lots of other types of comp companies and customers that are looking for carbon credits that they don't necessarily need that perfectly exact, super quantifiable you know, uncertainty for their credit. They're comfortable with something that is a little bit more, um, just a little bit more comfortable for the farmer to produce. 
So in those types of circumstances, we allow people that are creating credits on our system to either create a very accurate credit for an institutional buyer or to create a credit reflects their community. So it might be that they are, you know, choosing which ecological assets they want to monitor. They're defining what monitoring looks like for their community. They're defining what the co-benefits and the ecosystem analysis is that's appropriate for them. And they're creating assets that meet their community where it's at instead of where um, companies say that they should be. So a clear example of this is our organization is partnered with a number of indigenous communities in the Amazon who have historically not had positive experiences with the existing credits that are developed via the Red Plus program. And we have provided them a set of tools to create their own assets on their own cultural terms. Um, but if we spin back to the farmer and the perspective of carbon plus grasslands, the process is really extremely simple. There's an intake form on our website, on our land steward page. We collect a certain amount of location-based information, practices, property boundaries, um, observations of the property, historical data, particularly soil organic carbon uh, samples, micro macronutrients and bulk density. And an organization signs up to go through a sampling regimen as a companies remote sensing monitoring rounds. So the limited activities that a farmer has to do in this process is really sign up, go through the evaluation process that we have before we accept a property, begin the soil sample regimen, and then our organization and our decentralized teams of remote sensing monitors is the one that does all of that analysis of the property and produces the outcome reports. Our organization also um, provides farmers the opportunity to opt into our brokerage services, which is where we find companies like Microsoft or um, we're a cryptocurrency company. So we have blockchain companies that come to us to offset the energy use of their mining. There's a lot of different types of companies, but my role in that process is to steward um, with our land steward coordinator, ranchers into the ecosystem um, on terms that work for them. And then I ultimately take these markets out to the asset place or into the marketplace and ensure that the assets are efficiently and effectively sold. Um, and the demand for these assets, because they are very high quality, um, is really extremely large at this time. There's significantly more demand for carbon credits than there is in the global marketplace at this time. And there are very few methods that are really sufficiently accurate to give good market confidence, particularly for soil organic carbon. It is sort of a new paradigm that everyone is moving into. Um, and we're just happy to be, you know, cooperatively co-creative within this community to find solutions that work for farmers that can also be brought to market. Great, thank you. So Anthony, I'm gonna to come to you in a minute. Um, you know, you talked about supply being short and Sarah, you just said as well that the demand is high. So I assume that there's, there's, there's not yet the supply you need in order to meet that demand of these high quality credits. Um, Anthony, I'm gonna ask you about composting and then I'm gonna come back to Sarah and Elizabeth and talk about, okay, what types of practices qualify? But I know we've mentioned composting a couple of times in this and composting certainly is an important part of regenerative agriculture. Uh, but I know, Anthony, you wanted to specifically talk about composting in the context of your program and other programs. So why don't we start with you and then we'll we'll move move to Sarah and Elizabeth. Uh, sure. I mean, I think that. Um, so what we're talking about here with demand and supply of carbon credits, um, for me, I think the the discussion is almost a larger one, um, which is to say, you know, society has kind of gone completely against nature and basically takes, or like the human food system, uh, takes all the organic matter, locks it up in plastic bags and buries it in landfill where it's creating toxic methane. And, you know, we could be getting it back onto rangeland and farmland, uh, but there's not an economy that supports that. There's not even the infrastructure at the moment. Um, and so, you know, I think rather than have everything hinge on supply and demand of like carbon farmed meat or carbon credits to create the incentives um, that we basically just need to like to elevate compost and soil health to the same level um, of societal importance as renewable energy. And so to be thinking like, 
you know, instead of a city switching to like 80% renewable energy, 100% renewable energy or something, that we need to be thinking about targets for organic matter diversion. And California has recently passed um, something called SB 1383, which is uh, regulating a 75% reduction in organic matter in landfill um, relative to 2014 numbers. So that's like a really, really big shift that is supposed to happen by 2025. So the whole state you know, at the moment, maybe diverse about 10% of organic matter. So it's like literally, you know, almost like a biodiesel spill of just uh, organic matter and emissions that are going into landfill and instead could be going back into the soil. And so, you know, I think um, with branching and carbon credits, the issue is basically just that, you know, there's not, there's not a label, there's not an economy through which a rancher could go, you know, purchase 30 cubic yards of compost per acre or something really significant and start applying it um, for carbon markets. Like it would take so much upfront capital and all these different things that, um, you know, I think we're just very early in these stages. So I think that thinking about supply and demand is almost, you know, secondary to the structural shift that needs to occur. Yeah. You know, I saw a, a little quote the other day, I think it was on LinkedIn, when they said sustainability is a scarcity mindset. Regenerative agriculture is an abundance mindset. And I really like that because it is abundance and we have a lot of natural resources at our disposal, whether it's organic matter compost. For example, two months ago, uh, a little bucket showed up in my front yard. Our waste management company is taking all green kitchen waste and everything else and putting it into an anaerobic digester it creates energy, but also takes the digestate and makes it available to growers to put back on their farms. It's it's similar to what you just talked about, um, and you know it you know soil. I got to make sure I don't I don't get off on a tangent here on this. But like I said, I work for a microbial soil amendment company. Soil is alive. Soil is like a, a like yogurt. It really is. It's largely microbes. You know that that bind together. Uh, organic matter and 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 uh, 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 minerals, and actually organic matter is really not much more than a bunch of you know accumulating dead microbial bodies, and that compost is composed of food for those microbes as well as the microbes themselves. But I find it fascinating, you know. I've seen some papers recently where people at the at the, the USDA and the Carbon Underground have been able to show you literally can grow a centimeter of soil a year with regenerative agricultural practices. That by stimulating plant growth, those plants suck carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, they, they, they turn that photosynthate into leaves and stems and roots, but actually about 30, 40% of it gets exuded out through its roots to feed uh, the microbes and those microbes build up and that's what grows the soil. It really is an abundance situation. So there's you know, there's compost that we will take and rather than putting it in the landfill, put it down on the land, but we can also add microbes in order to accelerate that process of taking that resource, which is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and putting that in the land as quote unquote compost as well. So I, I think the science is, is contributing a lot to this. And, and, and like you say, I hope that as, as society, we can learn that there are many things we can do. Uh, you know, we're, we're largely speaking to farm, you know, ranch land and, and pasture managers today. And that's what animals do. They eat grass, and they, they put compost back out and stop it in with their hooves and remarkable things happen, happens to that soil. So um, so data and, 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 you know, trying to monitor or validate or document uh, what land managers are doing, uh, how much compost do you put on, how much inorganic fertilizer do you put on, what, what microbial soil amendments might have you used, soil measurements, nitrous oxide measurements. Uh, I'm heading towards you, Elizabeth, uh, in terms of collecting this data. At what point do you see that we're going to be able to perhaps automate some of this data collection? When, when, when does the 
the Internet of Things get to the point where you can take sensors in the soil, or you can take these multispectral satellite assessments that that uh, Regen is working with, or a variety of other things, or just farmer practices that they they put X amount of fertilizer on. You know, what at what point does all this get automated and validated in a in a kind of a quote unquote blockchain type system? Yeah, well, I think we're already starting to see that actually, and it's really what makes all of this ultimately scalable, right? And, and more accessible to more members of these communities and these networks that we're talking about. So as you said, IoT plays a really important role in all of this, thanks to investment and innovation, the per unit cost of various devices and sensors has really come down. There's also an incredible range of devices now available for all different types and uses. Um, they're also more ruggedized, right? So they can hold up better in outdoor environments. And they're typically small with a small amount of CPU. So the cloud is actually a really important complement or supplement to those devices. And so we actually have the opportunity now to capture data and information in a way that was frankly never really possible before, right? I like to say agriculture is an incredibly data dense, data rich industry from soil all the way through various parts of the value chain, you know, all the way through to transportation and logistics. But we're we're really, new, it's newer right in the last few to several years where we actually now have the capability to capture this through these various different devices and sensors. And so what you have to do is capture it and then pull it in right to some kind of central system, what you know, many of our customers do are really pulling that into a, what we call a data lake environment, enriching it with other sources of data. Sarah's talked about remote sensing, which is really important, bringing in satellite imagery, combining that with machine learning. That's what allows you to do a lot of that remote verification and sensing at scale um, and do, you know, kind of your, that gives you scale, right? And then if you can calibrate that with what's actually happening on the ground, um, then you can really develop a, a, a really robust picture of, of what's going on. And once you pull all that data and information into that data lake environment, enrich it maybe with other publicly available sources, right? Like um, from the Sergo database, weather, um, you know, other publicly available data sources, then you can really train those machine learning models and really set it up for really great analytics and insights. So you know, that, that's what we're seeing. And I, I definitely think it's happening and, and there's a full range, right? It's happening in a highly connected way in, in some environments and, and we're much earlier on in others, especially in certain geographies. Mm -hmm. So how, how does a member of this audience learn about what's available in terms of sensors or automated data collection? Where, where would you just suggest people go? Uh, to, to understand, okay, how can I learn about this? How can I how can I get a hold of some of this stuff? Yeah, that, well, that's a big question. Um, I mean, we maintain a device catalog for lots of our customers, um, but there's you know constant innovation happening in this space and sector, and there's a lot of early, very early stage companies that are doing a lot of really great work in terms of you know the hardware that's coming online. Um, what we find, though, are more companies are really creating solutions. So they may have some kind of a hardware device that is innovative in its particular category, but they're really building software and other capabilities around that to ultimately deliver insights and enabling their customers to really be able to make decisions, right? So they're creating platforms around those. Um, but we're also seeing other larger companies do a lot of really cool, innovative things around those sensors. So I think it's a matter of getting focused on what it is exactly you need and want to measure in order to really hone in on figuring out what device or sensor makes the most sense. Um, and then leveraging, you know, those, those different repositories or, or catalogs that are available to really figure out what to, what to zero in on. Yeah, maybe that's one thing we can do with the Jefferson Center, because we work with a lot of people, too, that have moisture sensors. Uh, uh, we have a project funded by ARPA right now with uh, Mark Zondel at Princeton University that literally is a really fairly inexpensive 
a set of equipment that you can set up to across as much as 2,000 acres, and it, it'll be two years before it's developed, but actually will, will it, it's a laser in a series of reflectors that sets up what's called nitro net that sets up uh, like a you know, like a greenhouse shield over over a, a field and literally will measure every molecule of nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, or methane that's coming off of that field or that feedlot or whatever it happens to be. Uh, that's why I was at Argonne National Labs the other day talking about, okay, what do you have to see in order to put this into your Greek model so we can validate it in a very real way? I mean, there's some stunning technology that's being developed. And I think one of the things, Olivia, we ought to make a note to ourselves and, and share with, uh, with Abby. And oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, Abby Smith normally would be on here giving us all kinds of wisdom, but Abby had a conflict today, so she was not able to join us. So she she, she, she entrusted me to, to, to run this and, and Olivia. So uh, that's why she is not here today. But um, perhaps we can begin to collect some of this in an easy to find website for, for people to take a look at some of these techniques that are coming along. Because I think over the next, not only the next five years, I think over the next year, Elizabeth, we're going to see some remarkable changes in automation of these things. Um, so Sarah, and I see you have answered uh, uh, some questions here in terms of, okay, what metrics, how often do people get paid? Can you talk about payments a little bit? I mean, how does that work? Do people get paid annually? What's the market price today? I mean, what, whatever you can share with people in terms of the economics of what's going on here. Yeah, sure. And I wanna share some things that link um, our process to some of the technological framings that Elizabeth put as well, because I think it really relates to a lot of these, um, these connections. So from the pricing perspective, I mean, the price of carbon is going up. It completely depends on your buyer. Ironically, some of the larger buyers are driving the price down because they're buying at such significant scales that they're um, demanding lower prices. Your average consumer, though, is probably paying above $25 uh, per carbon credit. So it's really uh, very project specific, very method specific, very ecosystem specific, very practice specific, and very buyer type specific regarding price. Um, but our program is set up says that we issue carbon credits on an annualized basis. They are calibrated four times in a 10 year time period and fully reconciled at the end of the 10 years. Um, and we redesigned that recently to ensure that ranchers are receiving income every year um, because the stability of cash flow is very critical for farm businesses and aligns with those needs from the economics of running a farm business. But what's interesting about the way our carbon credits are produced into the marketplace is that when we issue a credit, it is uh, done via an automated remote sensing methodology. So let's say we had some of these sensors Elizabeth was referring to, if they had the right inputs, they could run straight into our system and produce those outputs in you know, 45 minutes maximum. And then ultimately those carbon credits are issued on our blockchain ledger. And our blockchain ledger acts as an immutable record. Um, it's a system uniquely designed for the Paris Climate Accords, Article 6 Global Carbon Accounting requirements, um, which haven't entirely been set by the globe. But what it does is it issues digitally carbon credits in a place where they can be bought in various different forms. They can be bought by a Microsoft calling my office, buying the credit but they can also be collateralized into other types of financial asset products that can be bundled into bundled um, asset pools like portfolios. They can also be um, broken up like collateralized assets. They can be wrapped around other cryptocurrencies. There's a number of different ways in which we put assets into the marketplace. And that what is the marketplace conversation is very rapidly evolving because different organizations and different industries are asking for not just carbon credits uh, that check a box, and not even just carbon credits that take into account ecosystem function like our carbon plus credits do, they want those credits to be able to do different financial mechanisms from a tradability perspective. So I would say the buyer paradigm is really rapidly shifting across the globe right now. Great, thank you. I didn't get myself off mute. Um, okay. Um, so Maybe we could all talk a little bit too about this concepts of additionality and permanence. 
Uh, and we'll begin to start taking questions from the audience too. So anybody who's in the audience, please post your questions in the chat room and we'll, we'll, we'll try to get to them as we go here. We still have another, another half an hour or so on here. But you know, additionality is that concept of, of people buying these credits, institutional buyers anyway, and with the IPCC. And the IPCC is the International Panel on uh, uh, Climate Change. I uh, have said, well, that, that these credits shouldn't go to, 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 to people who've already been doing something for a long period of time. It needs to uh, incentivize practice change which personally seems crazy to me. Why would you not reward people who have been doing things for a long period of time? So that's one to comment on in terms of definition. And, and I'll start with Sarah, then we'll go to, to um, Elizabeth and Anthony to see if they have an opinion on this as well. And then permanence, which a lot of people, with again, the IPCC has said in terms of guidelines, well, 100 years. But you, for example, uh, Sarah just talked about a 10-year contract, at least I think that's what you, you said. How, how, how do you deal with, as Regen Network, with additionality and how do you deal with permanence? Yeah, so we have two paradigms. One is what does carbon plus say, which is a specific product with a specific requirements. And then how do we let other people handle these terms when they're creating assets in our marketplace? Because it is really a create your own environment as well as we have one product. So in terms of carbon plus, we've really followed a lot of the global standards and our look back time period for the project is no more than 10 years. Um, we ultimately made that decision because of all of our user engagement farmers, farmers wanted to get credit for the work that they had done, but we didn't feel that you could really lean too much further um, back in time from that because the benefits have you know, integrated into the ecosystem too far. Um, the way we deal with permanence as an organization is our carbon credits operate on for carbon plus a 25 year permanence time period. So project term is 10 years and a farmer is committing contractually to keeping that carbon in the ground for a 25 year time period. Um, and a lot of the marketplaces, particularly for grazing right now, um, particularly in Australia have a hundred year permanence requirements. And what happened when these assets were created in the marketplace is no rancher signed up. I think they're just barely now getting people considering, you know, three years after these things were created to engage with them because they weren't designed with farmers in mind. And so ultimately the time periods we have chosen are a balance between being able to put market assurances out into the marketplace that these credits are real, the work that happened historically um, can be included and that the permanence require is permanent enough that it's a stable asset putting out into the marketplace. But for a, a rancher to um, get credit in our system for their past work, they have to have the correct data. So if they do not have and have not historically collected the data that is necessary as the inputs for remote sensing, they aren't able to be grandfathered in historically. They have to start with a new soil sampling regimen. So there's challenges having conversations with folks about, you know, how long have you been doing this? And what we're ultimately looking for is when did they adopt a regenerative ranching practice? Not when did they start ranching on the property? Because what we look at is intensive rotational grazing in various different forms, but it's about that paddock herding and that quick movement that is ultimately the thing that is rapidly storing carbon across the property so there are very specific list of practices that qualify for our program and a very specific list of data requirements they have to meet to be grandfathered in. Very few ranchers meet those data requirements. In general though, our perspective on when someone's creating their own credit, their own asset, their own method on our ecosystem that goes into the open source public library that anybody can use around the globe, we have um, allowed people to establish uh, their own frameworks for how they want to look at historical data, how they want to look at permanence, how they want to look at land tenure. Because there are a lot of communities where these requirements, even ours, which are scaled back from some of the more standard marketplaces, that they're just too much for those communities, particularly indigenous communities, communities of color, smallholder farmers. So we are not designed beyond carbon plus grasslands. The one asset we created in the marketplace as an example, 
our network and platform is not designed to tell people what to do. It's designed to give them the tools to create for themselves so that assets can authentically reflect communities and authentically reflect practices and place appropriately. Yeah, no, that's great. You know, that's, I've worked with you quite a bit and I didn't quite fully understand that until today. And I think that's a really uh, a very good thing. Um, one thing, take a look at the, the question from Neil Maddie here. We'll come back to that. But I want to go to Anthony and Elizabeth to finish off this, this little bit of commentary on additionality and permanence. So Anthony, is, is are, are additionality and permanence terms that you deal with in your program? Uh, and if so, how, how, do, how do you look at that? Um, well, when we began the program, Zero Food Print was working with chefs and restaurants to go carbon neutral. So they would you know, make some best practices and then buy offsets um, for the remaining carbon footprint. And so for a long time, I was, you know, very interested in where soil carbon credits would go. Um, I mean, I still am and I'm supportive of the overall movement. Uh, but at some point we, you know, I kind of mentioned, stopped focusing on the individual behavior and sort of that purity contest and instead shifted to more of like the drawdown mindset of like, let's just start funding solutions as quickly as possible. Right, right. Um, and so we were in a conversation, you know, literally with the head of the California Air Resources Board, the chair, Mary Nichols, and she was saying, you know, listen, at CARB, our whole existence is to verify and account for carbon. Uh, yet when it comes to soil carbon, we think we need to move more quickly and we support directional action. Um, so that, you know, essentially was like our guidance on shifting our program in collaboration with CARB from a carbon credit program, you know, or something focused on that and kind of like, uh, those protocols and those terminologies and stuff to just something as scalable as possible, as quickly as possible. Um, and so, you know, I think if you imagine again, a, a citizen whose trash bill goes up a buck and they know the buck is helping to get compost onto farms and ranches, if somebody's sandwich goes up from $10 to 10 cents, I'm sorry, to $10 and 10 cents, you know, like that, that little shift, um, Basically, our feeling is that it's not, it's almost not worth uh, worrying about additionality and permanence because we need to move too quickly. Exactly. Well, I, I, I share that as well. You know, I think what's really interesting to me today, anyway, is both you and Sarah have talked about community action. As in the end, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, we're trying to move practices towards regenerative abundance mindsets. Uh, and I think you both have articulated things that 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 are are different and unique than at least what three years ago would have been considered. Oh, here's carbon market X. Here are the requirements. Here's what you do to qualify under additionality rules. Here's the permanence rules. And if you don't fit, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, too bad. Uh, I, I I I I love the fact that that's that's changing. So Elizabeth, how did how did how did how did how do you and in, in, in AWS look at at you know permanence and additionality? Well, our role is to support all of this, right, with the, right. the infrastructure and the services. And I would say that um, the perspective I can provide is what I'm hearing and seeing across the market, and I think it's very consistent with what both have articulated. And I I like what Sarah articulated, which is sort of you know one particular product with a lot more specifics around it. And then the one that is a bit more flexible, right? To fit unique situations. And the truth is there's a variety of different protocols and, and ways to do this, right? So our, our role is to support that flexibility. Um, but I would say, you know, there's a couple of trends that I'm seeing from customers, especially how they're engaging with farmer customers or suppliers, which um, in how they're doing this. And a lot of it is around having that data collection and providing some kind of baseline and then being able to demonstrate, right, the differences and changes as a result of those practices that are being implemented. So for many of our customers, you know, they've had some digitally enabled platform or product for a long period of time, potentially a decade or more. And so actually they do have that baseline from which to work. And to demonstrate, you know, the changes that result from the implementation of different practices, whether it's 
choosing to use a cover crop or a no-till practice or you know whatever it is that's that's being implemented. So we often see that having that um, that history is is an important part of establishing that baseline. And then also we're seeing remote sensing and imagery being a really important part of that too to understand how that land has changed over time and really being able to sense um, to sense what's been happening and how and what the results look like on the ground. Yeah, absolutely. And as I said earlier, I think it's it's not just to get payments, but actually, you know, if you can measure these things, you can actually improve the productivity of your pastures or your cornfield, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Well, it's also how you create a feedback loop around what's yeah. really working and what's right. having the greatest impact, right? Which ultimately right. is really important too. Cause I don't think it's just sort of monitoring, measuring monitoring, measuring, there's also a, a whole feedback loop that can be a really important part of how do we all get smarter and better about this together, right? I think what everybody's described today is the importance of the network effect, right? Um, in, in creating these communities that can inform each other and educate each other. Sarah talked about evangelists. You know, I, I think that that's really important too. How do we know what's, what's really working, right? Unless we can measure it and see those results. Yeah, no. It's exciting. So, um, and and Sarah, you answered this question uh, on the chat, but I think it's worth talking about. And I, I'm trying to see where it was now. But um, yeah, Neil it, it had asked, while well, prices are going up, you know, can a, mm-hmm. can somebody take credits and and hold on to them, you know, to wait for them to increase in value? How do, how does that work? When when a credit's generated, does it have to be sold right then, or can can it be held in escrow by somebody to to wait to almost like a futures market? What how would you explain that to people? Yeah, there's a number of different ways uh, that different people do it, and it really depends on the outcomes that people are after. Um, and I, I think that you know, kind of before launching into the connection to this is really what you know Elizabeth was alluding to the network. So ultimately, all of our organizations exist in order to bring forth all these resources to resource, you know, organizations and entities' ability to create. That's what Amazon's doing with their web services and their support with all the folks that are doing more supply chain work. That's what Anthony's trying to do with his, you know, soil grants, and that's what we're trying to do with asset development. And ultimately, Regen Network is about bringing the whole network together and creating tools and libraries and resources that are open source and become ownership by the community at large. So in the context of issuing credits, you could hold them in an escrow account if you wanted to and wait to see uh, what the price is. Um, No one has asked to do that yet. I think people are excited to be able to be paid in a new way for their work now. And ultimately a lot of ranchers want that capital in order to expand their herd, in order to buy more land, in order to make improvements. Um, But carbon credits are an asset. They are a financial asset in the marketplace. When you sell them to a company, like when we sold to Microsoft, they auto retire them. So for a company that is looking to claim these assets towards their carbon footprint, they're going to auto retire them, which puts them in a permanently non-tradable position. They are auto retired on our blockchain and can never be reissued, recounted, claimed again, traded again, or moved again on our blockchain because it's a permanent and immutable record, which means it's a permanent file folder of a status of ownership or where the credit came from, what method was used, et cetera. But then there are other organizations that are, they're buying credits and they are issuing them out into the marketplace and they want to Um, be able to use them for tradability purposes in the future. They're hanging on to them. They're kept in a tradable position. They might sell them for a higher price later. They might be collecting Amazon forest credits to create another product. So there are a lot of these financial derivative scenarios that happen, but ultimately each rancher that issues credits and sells them on our marketplace, they get to set their own price. They can say no to a buyer if I bring them to the table. Um, And if they chose to hang on to their own credits, which are issued to them, that they have ownership over, they can choose when they want to put them into the marketplace. And again, it's about empowerment and choice. And Regen Network is simply a platform with a system and tools inviting everyone to come and create. And we don't tell farmers how to price their credits. We'll recommend that 
I can't contractually make anybody um, do something that I tell them to do. This is, all, this is a system of like complete and total autonomy within our framework. Yeah, no, no, thank you. I think one message here today is that we are a community of people. Uh, you know, right now there's 19 of us. <laughs> we're, we're a community of 19 people trying to understand what's going on and how we can help each other. And I really like that mindset because uh, in the end, and it, it, it kind of started with, with Anthony with what you're doing that, okay, screw the bureaucracy, let's just go get something done. Uh, so let's take a certain percentage and let's take a market and let's try to get some money and grants back to growers to help them uh, uh, use practices that science in general has told us does work and it does. I think it's amazing in terms of what you can see out there. I do a lot of traveling and uh, especially in a drought year like today, if you you know you visit cornfields or even ranches for that matter, and 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 in the midst of this drought, and people that are that are using regenerative practices, if you if you can see for a couple of miles, you can see those farms and ranches that are using these practices. It's absolutely amazing in terms of you know how the plants look, how the pasture looks. Uh, because we all realize that not only you're putting carbon in soil, but you know, for every 1% organic matter, you can store another 25,000 gallons of water in the soil. You get nutrient recycling naturally. Uh, you know, we often talk that, oh gosh, the you know, crops and food is not as nutritious as it, as it used to be. We must have mined all the micronutrients out of the soil. Well, from a technical perspective, that's not really the case. What has happened is that we have depleted the microbial functionality of those soils and that's the microbes that make those micronutrients available and get them into the plants. And so whether it's composting or, or rotational, uh, intensive rotation with animals uh, or adding uh, microbial soil amendments, we can rebuild that soil health. And it really, it, it, it really is amazing as to the science that's here. But as we've all said today, the key is, okay, how can we all learn from each other and each community decide how it wants to handle that? and how it might want to benefit from it, either external from other people uh, in, in, in the world, or just keep those benefits to the, to the community at, at large here. And I think it's an, an exciting time. Um, we're getting close to time. I just would open it up to, to, to Sarah, uh, uh, Elizabeth, and Anthony in terms of any finishing comments that you'd like to make, if any. I just well can i pose a question to this group sure because so much knowledge here in this um i'm curious because we've been talking a lot about offsets right and the ability to trade within a market context there's also the concept of insets right which is where you create something and the way we think about this is actually a digital asset that attaches itself to a product and can actually it you think that it then becomes an attribute of that product as opposed to something separate that can be traded in and of itself. And I'm just curious how this group thinks about that and you know the the role for both for, for both of those models and, and how we think about that going forward. Sarah, do you want to tackle that? Yeah, maybe I'll tackle that. And it kind of relates to why Regen Network was originally created. So our founders had another company called Terragenesis International, which was purely agriculture product insetting, particularly in the Amazon and uh, Central America regions. And they felt like an insetting approach was extremely limiting. Um, and so far as, you know, there is ultimately a company that is absorbing that carbon into their portfolio from their supply chain. And it is much harder to attribute that asset um, into the marketplace because the premium that the market's going to pay someone for regenerative cacao with a carbon negative certification associated with it. Um, is really driven by the same market forces. Um, and so the goal of Regent Network and the reason it was created was to step outside the market forces and to add other layers of forces um, into this process. But to that, you know, conversely to that same note, our blockchain is designed with modules that are interoperable, our data module, eco credits module, curation module, our NFT modules. 
um, to meet all these different solutions with the underlying blockchain data resources that can support an insetting module where they can set, uh, they can be utilized for carbon credits in the marketplace. You could green wrap Bitcoin. Um, it's, it's an interoperable set of, of data solutions that are meant to create the appropriate record keeping and record keeping modular system for no matter which paradigm we're working in within the agricultural industry. So we as an organization, um, when we have insetting partners, which we definitely do, we tend to hand them off to our partners at Terra Genesis because insetting is their specialization. And when they're able to create some type of methodology that can be added into the library that is unique to right now they're doing cacao in Ecuador um, is one of the ones that they're creating. It becomes a part of that open source resource library that then anybody doing regenerative cacao and setting can take that off the shelf method, also use it and use it for the way in which they're accounting for their product carbon from an insetting perspective. So we are tools first and really sort of hands off once we've created interoperable tools and we allow people to kind of take the pathway that's appropriate for their agricultural product on our ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah. Anthony, any, any comment on all that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, our grant program assigns bonuses to applicants who are in the supply chain of participating uh, zero food print members. So in that sense, we're sort of, um, you know, prioritizing mm -hmm. that in setting and circular economy and resonance. Uh, but I think you could almost think of, you know, zero food print or the concept of a circular economy as an inset anyway. Mm -hmm. Like just, you know, not that this is going to happen anytime soon, but if Amazon just added 1% on every purchase and then just used that to mm -hmm. allow any Amazon produce, you know, product on Amazon to like use that money to do carbon reduction, you know, that would be one big inset instead of like individual insets attached to individual products that you then like cross your fingers and hope someone's going to pay some huge premium for. I mean, so I think in settings critical, we basically need every sector in the food system and in every sector, you know, energy, everything to just start in setting the whole economy with climate solutions. Yeah, that's yeah. great. So Elizabeth, there's a suggestion for you to take to Mr. Bezos. And <laughs> well, we do that. have our climate flip, climate pledge yeah. friendly because of course, you know, we we've launched the climate pledge um, at Amazon and we do have climate pledge products on Amazon.com that are designated as climate pledge friendly, um, which are related to particular certifications. So um, that is it's, a, that it's is, a start. Yeah. Yeah. It's the beginning of that, but it's, it's interesting to hear this because I, I see a role for both and I'm seeing a demand for both. And in some really large global supply chains, especially ones that are more fully managed, the, this, the insets seem as though they can be an incredibly scalable model, right? And so, um, but being able to measure them and actually track them in a true track and trace kind of supply chain solution is a really important part of that, so. Okay. Yeah, and I think that just to kind of seam this back to your data concept, you know, there's all this data. Anthony's got great data. Amazon's got data. All of our network partners have data. And so we, um, as an organization, are part of something called Open Team, which is a USDA funded ag tech consortium specifically about data interoperability, which we welcome everybody who wants to join to come join. Um, but what we're doing in that environment and we're doing in conjunction with uh, the Regen One working group um, from Google and Google Earth Engine at this point is we've started a new project where we're um, building a global regenerative ecosystems map where you can add a pin for a practice on a place, get all of the data from that to globally inform and in an open source manner, decision-making tools about where to do what you're doing or how to expand it or what might the outcomes of that be. So at the end of the day. Sarah, you're breaking up a little bit. I don't know if it's me or you. I'm getting it too. So I think it's yeah. just a little Wi-Fi problem on that end. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's a whole new conversation to maybe open up there, but these things all seem together. Um, Right, Sarah, you broke up for like maybe 15 seconds in, the, in that, in your in your new home with your new Wi-Fi. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but I think I think we caught most of that. Yeah, but that's 
It it it, it is good. I, I think I, I actually I, I've learned quite a bit today, and I, I, I want to follow it up. Um, you know, one just logistically, what we're going to do uh, is a we'll 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 send all the registrants your websites and and you know maybe links to some of the information that we talked about today. And of course, as as Abby has noted and Olivia has noted that. You know, we had a certain number of people on the call today, but we had a lot of registries uh, and that they're probably going to listen to this uh, later on. So we we certainly welcomed everybody who joined us in person today. But as we finish here, I, you know, I want to welcome everybody who takes the interest in watching this recording as well. Uh, but we will be fin sending follow up information to everybody. And if there are further questions, uh, we can connect you directly to Anthony, Elizabeth uh, or Sarah. I'm sure they'd be happy to, to take your questions after this event as well, because it is all about a community. And I, I, I'm just you know, really excited by the, the, the growing number of, of people that take an interest in this, both within the agriculture and ranching community and, and outside of it as well. So with that, I don't see any more questions on the chat room. Uh, I would once again like to thank you, Anthony, Sarah, and Elizabeth for taking your valuable time today and uh, sharing your insights. And, and uh, we'll go ahead and, and close unless you have any comments, Olivia, that you would like to make. No, I would just say that, um, yeah, I'll be sending everyone an email with some pertinent links and contact information and um, names of some of the organizations and programs that were talked about so we can all have um, just a little bit of a record of all of that and we can all connect everyone. All right. Well, enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Goodbye and thank you again. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks Goodbye. Paul. Thanks Olivia.